Uh, let's see. So there was a news item about a uh, Japanese commuter train that left the station 20 seconds early, and the company had to apologize to all of the patrons. <laughs> we are not that punctual at Miami-Dade College. <laughs> And I don't know if anyone's ever going to apologize to you, so it's up to you to keep civility going today, okay? Uh, I do want us to get in and out on time. That, that, that's why they hired me. Uh, my name is Patrick. I, I won't give you my last name. Uh, I, I, wor I work here at the college, and uh, I have some boilerplate I must mention. Give me a moment. I must not want to do it because I can't find it. Anyway, I'm supposed to uh, uh, recognize our sponsors. OHL, the construction company, uh, the Bachelor Foundation, the DeGroote Family Foundation, and uh, help me out here. Anyway, we have another major sponsor who will probably sue me for not doing this. And let's see, what else? So the book fair goes on all year long. We have events with authors throughout the year. Keep in touch with us. Check out our website for our cultural events. And uh, we're just so thankful you're here. And uh, autographing by the author of her book will be in the red autograph zone. That you ride the escalator down, make a left in the atrium. It's right here in this building. So following the presentation, she will graciously go down there and chat with you and autograph books. So let me introduce Jennifer Egan. Jennifer Egan is a, a, a prize-winning author of, of five previous books of fiction, including A Visit from the Goon Squad, which won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award. Uh, there are several others, The Keep, uh, The Story Collection, The Emerald City, Look At Me, a National Book Award finalist, and The Invisible Circus. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's Magazine, Garanta, McSweeney's, and The New York Times Magazine. And she's here uh, to, I'm going to ha have her introduce her new novel, Manhattan Beach, to you. I know you're not here to listen to me, so I'm gone. Yes, Jennifer. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. I love this book fair so much that even though I was in the UK last week and in fact was reading in Dublin the night before last, I said there has to be a way to get back to New York via Miami, isn't there? And then I learned, yes, you can, that, that is possible. And then when I got on the plane, I was really startled to hear that it was going to be like a 10-hour flight. I thought, Oh, okay, it's actually a lot further <laughs> to go to Miami from, uh, from the UK than to directly to New York, but I'm thrilled that I did it and, and glad to meet all of you today. I'm going to say a couple of, works, uh, of words about how I came to write a historical novel, and particularly in the period that um, Manhattan Beach is set, which is New York during World War II. Then I'm going to read the first chapter, take questions, and then we can continue the conversation if we don't finish it um, in the signing table. Um, so I had been thinking about New York during World War II, I think starting really with 9-11. The city became a war zone overnight, and it was really shocking. Um, part of the city was closed off. There was a strong military presence. And I think it led me and, and many others to wonder about what it was like to be in New York during World War II when there was such a fear of a sea or an air invasion. And um, so I, in about 2004, I started looking at images of New York during World War II. And what was so striking to me was the, the dominance of the waterfront. Feel, come in, feel free. We're, I'm just going to keep blabbing. I won't start reading for a while. Um, and that was especially surprising because I had been living in New York since 1987 and had barely grazed the waterfront. I mean, I had gone on a circle line tour, I think, when I first got there. I liked to run along the river, and that was about it. Uh, and yet, what was so clear was that New York during the war was the port of New York, really. And so, in a certain way, I followed the waterfront into all different realms that became important in this book. The first one that, that was just unavoidable was the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, which is on a small bay called Wallabout Bay um, along the East River of New York. And it was the largest builder and repairer of allied ships in the world. It began doing that work before America got involved in the war. It was already expanding by then. 
Um, it repaired some 5,000 ships from all over the world, built 17 battleships, including the USS Missouri, where the Japanese surrender was signed. Um, and it, it, it undertook engineering feats like, uh, in the case of two ships that were destroyed, one the forward end and one the after end, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, they were both cut in half and the two, the front of one and the back of the other were welded together to create a new ship. Apparently it lined up within the, the centimeter. And the new ship was named after the one of the ships that I guess had a couple of extra inches on the other, much to the ire of the, uh, the ship whose name vanished in the process. So it was an amazing place, and it employed about 70,000 people at the height of the war, of whom almost 5,000 were women. And that became fascinating to me, and I actually got involved in an oral history project interviewing some of these ladies who had worked at the yard. And luckily, I was doing this in the first decade of the 21st century because they were in their 80s then. And in fact, when I visited the Miami Book Fair in 2006, I first went to a couple of retirement communities um, and visited two women who had remained friends all those years later, having met at the Navy Yard and worked together there. So it, those were remarkable experiences. Um, it was really the Brooklyn Navy Yard that led me to deep sea diving, which is a very important part of this book. Unbeknownst to me, deep sea diving is actually an important part of ship repair. And it, it makes sense when you think about it that rather than immediately put a ship into dry dock, of course, divers go under and try to examine the damage. Often they do patching. Sometimes they can even make the repair. But certainly they can, they can learn a lot before the ship goes into dry dock. And, uh, and in order to research that, again, this is before 2010 when A Visit from the Goon Squad came out, I fell in with a group of army diving veterans who have a very tight-knit organization and army diving equipment is identical to Navy. And in 2009, I attended their reunion. And one of their, the things they offer to their members at reunions is the chance to dive in the old Mark V equipment in a tank. And the Mark V is the, is the kind of classic, iconic diving suit that any of us would probably conjure, the, the spherical helmet and the big lead boots and the lead belt. Um, and I had the opportunity to be dressed in that 200-pound diving dress, which was something I'll never forget, um, and couldn't endure for very long. And also at that reunion, I was, had the chance to interview a gentleman named Jim Kennedy, who had dived in the harbor of Cherbourg during World War II and, uh, and helped to clear out the debris that the Germans blew up to make the harbor unusable. Um, and that was also very meaningful. Uh, he passed away unexpectedly very shortly after that conversation, and I'm, I feel very lucky to have been able to do that. Uh, another element of the waterfront that was inevitable, it was organized crime. It was a very dirty place, <laughs> Immortal, immortalized in the film On the Waterfront, which is actually derived from a series of newspaper exposés of the corruption, the corrupt unions um, on the New York, the West Side waterfront, which was known as the Irish waterfront. Uh, but I also got involved, too, in, in um, the organized crime that we think what, that was called the syndicate, which was a more multi-ethnic uh, branch of organized crime that essentially had been distributing liquor uh, since Prohibition began in 1919 um, and was also pretty fascinating. So all of this was going on. Uh, I was writing and publishing other books. I, had, I found myself on the advisory committee of a new museum space that was opening at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And at a certain point I thought, am I really gonna write a book or is this just sort of a, a hobby gone amok? Um, and so it seemed like it was really time to try to actually do something with, with some of this material. But since I begin a novel with only a sense of time and place and no clear idea of even who my characters will be, much less what will happen, I, in a certain sense, was empty-handed, and I sat down, and to my surprise, I was writing about a period earlier than what I had intended to write about, in which the woman I had sort of vaguely thought would be at the Brooklyn Navy Yard was still a child. So I'm going to read that to you now. The first section of the book is called The Shore. 
They'd driven all the way to Mr. Stiles' house before Anna realized that her father was nervous. First, the ride had distracted her, sailing along Ocean Parkway as if they were headed for Coney Island, although it was four days past Christmas and impossibly cold for the beach. Then the house itself, a palace of golden brick, three stories high, windows all the way around, a rowdy flapping of green and yellow striped awnings. It was the last house on the street, which dead-ended at the sea. Her father eased the Model J against the curb and turned off the motor. Toots, he said, don't squint at Mr. Stiles' house. Of course I won't squint at his house. You're doing it now. <laughs> no, she said, I'm making my eyes narrow. <laughs> That's squinting, he said, you've just defined it. Not for me. He turned to her sharply, don't squint. That was when she knew. She heard him swallow dryly and felt a chirp of worry in her stomach. She was not used to seeing her father nervous. Distracted, yes. Preoccupied, certainly. Why doesn't Mr. Stiles like squinting, she asked. No one does. Ooh, forgot to tell you that part, guys. I'm gonna turn off those phones. Hope I turned mine off. Uh, all right. Distracted, yes. Preoccupied, certainly. Why doesn't Mr. Stiles like squinting, she asked. No one does. You never told me that before. Would you like to go home? No, thank you. I can take you home. If I squint, if you give me the headache I'm starting to get. If you take me home, Anna said, you'll be awfully late. She thought he might slap her. He'd done it once after she'd let fly a string of curses she'd heard on the docks, his hand finding her cheek invisibly as a whip. The specter of that slap still haunted Anna with the odd effect of heightening her boldness in defiance of it. Her father rubbed the middle of his forehead, then looked back at her. His nerves were gone. She had cured them. Anna, he said, you know what I need you to do. Of course. Be your charming self with Mr. Stiles' children while I speak with Mr. Stiles. I knew that, Papa. Of course you did. She left the Model J with eyes wide and watering in the sun. It had been their own automobile until after the stock market crash. Now it belonged to the union, which lent it back for her father to do union business. Anna liked to go with him when she wasn't in school, to racetracks, communion breakfasts, and church events, buildings where elevators lofted them to high floors, occasionally even a restaurant, but never before to a private home like this. The door pull was answered by Mrs. Stiles, who had a movie star's sculpted eyebrows and a long mouth painted glossy red. Accustomed to, ju to judging her own mother prettier than every woman she encountered, Anna was disarmed by the evident glamour of Mrs. Stiles. I was hoping to meet Mrs. Kerrigan, Mrs. Stiles said in a husky voice, holding Anna's father's hand in both of hers to which he replied that his younger daughter had taken sick that morning and his wife had stayed at home to nurse her. There was no sign of Mrs. Stiles. Miss, Mr. Stiles' daughter, Tabitha, was only eight, three years younger than Anna. Still, Anna allowed the littler girl to tow her by the hand to a downstairs nursery, a room dedicated purely to playing, filled with a shocking array of toys. A quick survey discovered a flossy flirt doll, several large teddy bears, and a rocking horse. There was a nurse in the nursery, a freckled, raspy-voiced woman whose woolen dress strained like an overstacked bookshelf to repress her massive bust. Anna guessed from the broad lay of her face and the merry switch of her eyes that nurse was Irish and felt a danger of being seen through. She resolved to keep her distance. Two small boys, twins or at least interchangeable, were struggling to attach electric train tracks. Partly to avoid nurse, who rebuffed the boys' pleas for help, Anna crouched beside the disjointed tracks and proffered her services. She could feel the logic of mechanical parts in her fingertips. This came so naturally that she could only think that other people didn't really try. They always looked which was as useless when assembling things as studying a picture by touching it. 
Anna fastened the piece that was vexing the boys and took several more from the freshly opened box. It was a Lionel train, the quality of the tracks palpable in the resolve with which they interlocked. As she worked, Anna glanced occasionally at the flossy flirt doll wedged at the, edge, at the end of a shelf. She had wanted one so violently two years ago that some of her desperation seemed to have broken off and stayed inside her. It was strange and painful to discover that old longing now in this place. Tabitha cradled her new Christmas doll, a Shirley Temple in a fox fur coat. She watched and tranced as Anna built her brother's train tracks. Where do you live, she asked. Not far. By the beach? Near it. May I come to your house? Of course, Anna said, fastening tracks as fast as the boys handed them to her. A figure eight was nearly complete. Have you any brothers? Tabitha asked. A sister, Anna said. She's eight, like you, but she's mean because of being so pretty. Tabitha looked alarmed. How pretty? Extremely pretty, Anna said gravely, then added, she looks like our mother who danced with the follies. The error of this boast accosted her a moment later. Never part with a fact unless you've no choice. Her father's voice in her ears. After lunch, as a reward for their fine behavior, nurse allowed them to bundle into coats and hats and bolt from a back door along a path that ran behind Mr. Stiles' house to a private beach. A long arc of snow-dusted sand tilted down to the sea. Anna had been to the docks in winter many times, but never to a beach. Miniature waves shrugged up under skins of ice that crackled when she stomped them. Seagulls screamed and dove in the riotous wind, their bellies stark white. The twins had brought along Buck Rogers ray guns, but the wind turned their shots and death throes into pantomime. Anna watched the sea. There was a feeling she had standing at its edge, an electric mix of attraction and dread. What would be exposed if all of that water should suddenly vanish? A landscape of lost objects, sunken ships, hidden treasure, gold and gems, and the charm bracelet that had fallen from her wrist into a storm drain. Dead bodies, her father always added with a laugh. To him, the ocean was a wasteland. Your shoes are getting wet, Tabby said through chattering teeth. Should we take them off, Anna asked, to feel the cold? I don't want to feel it. I do. Tabby watched Anna unbuckle the straps of the black patent leather shoes she shared with Zara Klein downstairs. She unrolled her wool stockings and placed her white, bony, long-for-her-age feet in the icy water. Each foot delivered an agony of sensation to her heart, one part of which was a flame of ache that felt unexpectedly pleasant. What's it like, Tabby shrieked. Cold, Anna said, awful, awful cold. It took all of her strength to keep from recoiling and her resistance added to the odd excitement. Glancing toward the house, she saw two men in dark overcoats following the paved path set back from the sand. Holding their hats in the wind, they looked like actors in a silent picture. Are those our papas? Daddy likes to have business talks outdoors, Tabby said, away from prying ears. Anna felt benevolent compassion toward young Tabitha, excluded from her father's business affairs when Anna was allowed to listen in whenever she pleased. She heard little of interest. Her father's job was to pass greetings or good wishes between union men and other men who were their friends. These salutations included an envelope, sometimes a package, that he would deliver or receive casually. You wouldn't notice unless you were paying attention. Over the years, he'd talked to Anna a great deal without knowing he was talking, and she had listened without knowing what she heard. She was surprised by the familiar, animated way her father was speaking to Mr. Stiles. Apparently, they were friends, after all that. The men changed course and began crossing the sand toward Anna and Tabby. Anna stepped hurriedly out of the water, but she'd left her shoes too far away to put them back on in time. 
Mr. Stiles was a broad, imposing man with brilliantined black hair showing under his hat brim. Say, is this your daughter, he said, withstanding Arctic temperatures without so much as a pair of stockings? Anna sensed her father's displeasure. So it is, he said. Anna, say good day to Mr. Stiles. Very pleased to meet you, she said, shaking his hand firmly as her father had taught her and taking care not to squint as she peered up at him. Mr. Stiles looked younger than her father without shadows or creases in his face. She sensed an alertness about him, a humming tension, perceptible even through his billowing overcoat. He seemed to await something to react to or be amused by. Right now, that something was Anna. Mr. Stiles crouched beside her on the sand and looked directly into her face. Why the bare feet, he asked. Don't you feel the cold or are you showing off? Anna had no ready answer. It was neither of those, more an instinct to keep Tabby awed and guessing. But even that she couldn't articulate. Why would I show off? She said, I'm nearly 12. Well, what's it feel like? She smelled mint and liquor on his breath, even in the wind. It struck her that her father couldn't hear their conversation. It only hurts at first, she said. After a while, you can't feel anything. Mr. Stiles grinned as if her reply were a ball he'd taken physical pleasure in catching. Words to live by, he said, then rose again to his immense height. She's strong, he remarked to Anna's father. So she is. Her father avoided her eyes. Mr. Stiles brushed sand from his trousers and turned to go. He'd exhausted that moment and was looking for the next. They're stronger than we are, Anna heard him say to her father. Lucky for us, they don't know it. She thought he might turn and look back at her, but he must have forgotten. It's a little section break. Dexter Stiles felt sand working its way inside his oxfords as he slogged back to the path. Sure enough, the toughness he'd sensed coiled in Ed Kerrigan had flowered into magnificence in the dark-eyed daughter. Proof of what he'd always believed, men's children gave them away. It was why Dexter rarely did business with any man before meeting his family. He wished his tabby had gone barefoot, too. Kerrigan drove a 28 Duesenberg Model J, Niagara Blue, evidence both of fine taste and of bright prospects before the crash. He had an excellent tailor. Yet there was something obscure about the man, something that worked against the clothing and automobile and even his blunt, deft conversation a shadow, a sorrow. Then again, who hadn't one or several? By the time they reached the path, Dexter found himself decided upon hiring Kerrigan, assuming that suitable terms could be established. Say, have you time for a drive to meet an old friend of mine, he, sa he asked. Certainly, Kerrigan said. Your wife isn't expecting you? Not before supper. Your daughter, will she worry? Kerrigan laughed. Anna? It's her job to worry me. Anna expected any moment to be, pulled, to be called off the beach by her father, but it was Nurse who eventually came, huffing indignantly, and ordered them out of the cold. The light had changed, and the playroom felt heavy and dark. It was warmed by its own wood stove. They ate walnut cookies and watched the electric train race around the figure eight, Anna had built real steam straggling from its miniature smokestack. She had never seen such a toy, could not imagine how much it might cost. She was sick of this adventure. It had lasted far longer than their sociable visits usually did, and playing a part for the other children had exhausted Anna. It felt like hours since she'd seen her father. Eventually, the boys left the train running and went to look at picture books. Nurse had nodded off in a rocking chair, Tabby lay on a braided rug, pointing her new kaleidoscope at the lamp. Casually, Anna asked, may I hold your flossy flirt? Tabby assented vaguely, and Anna carefully lifted the doll from the shelf. Flossy flirts came in four sizes, and this was the second smallest, not the newborn baby, but a somewhat larger baby with startled blue eyes. Anna turned the doll on her side. Sure enough, just as the newspaper ads had promised, the blue irises slid into the corners of her eyes as if keeping Anna in sight. 
She felt a burst of pure joy that nearly made her laugh. The doll's lips were drawn into a perfect O. Below her top lip were two painted white teeth. As if catching the scent of Anna's delight, Tabby jumped to her feet. You can have her, she cried. I never play with her anymore. Anna absorbed the impact of this offer. Two Christmases ago, when she'd wanted the flossy flirt so acutely, she hadn't dared ask. Ships had stopped coming in, and they hadn't any money. The extreme physical longing she'd felt for the doll scissored through her now, upsetting her deep knowledge that, of course, she must refuse. No, thank you, she said at last. I have a bigger one at home. I just wanted to see what the small one was like. She forced herself to replace the flossy flirt on the shelf, keeping a hand on one rubbery leg until she felt nurse's eyes upon her. Feigning indifference, she turned away. Too late. Nurse had seen and knew. When Tabby left the room to answer a call from her mother, nurse seized the flossy flirt and half flung it at Anna. Take it, dear, she whispered fiercely. She doesn't care. She's more toys than she can ever play with. They all have. Anna wavered, half believing there might be a way to take the doll without having anyone know. But the mere thought of her father's reaction hardened her reply. No, thank you, she said coldly. I'm too old for dolls anyway. Without a backward glance, she left the playroom, but nurse's sympathy had weakened her, and her knees shook as she climbed the stairs. As they drove away from Mr. Stiles' house, Anna searched for the right clever remark to disarm her father, the kind she'd made thoughtlessly when she was smaller, his startled laughter, her first indication she'd been funny. Lately, she often found herself trying to recapture an earlier state, as if some freshness or innocence had passed from her. I suppose Mr. Stiles wasn't in stocks, she said finally. He chuckled and pulled her to him. Mr. Stiles doesn't need stocks. He owns nightclubs and other things. Is he with the union? Oh, no. He's nothing to do with the union. This was a surprise. Generally speaking, union men wore hats and longshoremen wore caps. Some, like her father, might wear either, depending on the day. Anna couldn't imagine her father with a longshoreman's hook when he was dressed well, as now. Her mother saved exotic feathers from her piecework and used them to trim his hats. She retailored his suits to match the styles and flatter his ropey frame. He'd lost weight since the ships had stopped coming in and he took less exercise. Her father drove one-handed, a cigarette cocked between two fingers at the wheel, the other arm around Anna. She leaned against him. In the end, it was always the two of them in motion, Anna drifting on a tide of sleepy satisfaction. Why the bare feet, toots, he asked, as she'd known he would. To feel the water. That's something little girls do. Tabitha is eight, and she didn't. She'd better sense. Mr. Stiles liked that I did. You've no idea what Mr. Stiles thought. I have. He talked to me when you couldn't hear. I noticed that, he said, glancing at her. What did he say? Her mind reached back to the sand, the cold, the ache in her feet, and the man beside her, curious. All of it fused now with her longing for that flossy flirt. He said I was strong, she said, a lump tightening her voice. Her eyes blurred. And so you are, toots, he said, kissing the top of her head. Anyone can see that. I'm now just going to skip ahead and read a teeny bit of the next chapter. They go back to the apartment, and Dexter Stiles' name comes up at dinner to Eddie, Eddie Anna's father's horror. Um, but she knows enough to not say anything or to mention that they have just spent the day with that gentleman. And her father comes and visits her in her room after dinner. You were right, toots, he said softly, not to mention Mr. Stiles at supper. In fact, best not to say his name to anyone. Except you? Not even me. And I won't say it either. We can think it, but not say it. Understand? He braced himself for her inevitable guff. But Anna seemed enlivened by this subterfuge. Yes. Now, who were we talking about? There was a pause. Mr. Hoosis, she finally said. That's my girl, 
married to Mrs. Whatsis. Bingo. Anna felt herself beginning to forget, lulled by the satisfaction of sharing a secret with her father, of pleasing him uniquely. The day with Tabitha and Mr. Stiles became like one of those dreams that shreds and melts even as you try to gather it up. And they lived in who knows where land. She imagined it, a castle by the sea disappearing under a fog of forgetfulness. So they did, her father said, so they did. Beautiful, wasn't it? Thank you. And now I'm very happy to take questions. You can shout it out or go to the microphone, whatever you want. <laughs> I think shouting out is going to be our, <laughs> our procedure, <laughs> and I'll repeat it. It's on now. Oh, so now it works. I'm okay. going to walk over and turn on the other one. I have help. <laughs> Thank you. So we've got two mics on. If you want to line up here, anyone who'd like to. Or if you're shy, which I am about doing that, <laughs> shout it out. <laughs> yes. So the, the questioner has um, kindly selected Manhattan Beach with her book group, for which I'm eternally grateful. I'm a huge believer in book groups. We, in my book group, we read In Search of Lost Time by Proust over a period of six years. <laughs> and we, had, we gave birth to five children among us in, in the time that we were reading Proust. So we had a kind of real time unfolding. Anyway, she, the questioner had heard that, that to, in some way this book was about parenthood and was wondering if that was so. I would say yes. I mean, it, but you, you ask whether it's the theme, and I would say that there's hopefully never just sort of a theme in my books because I feel like life is incredibly complicated and the job of fiction is to try to suggest all of that complication and, and different ages, voices, walks of life that we all encounter every day in a, in a compressed form that is hopefully um, you know, exciting and entertaining. But yes, one of the things that, uh, that I discovered as I was working on this book was, was how much it was about parenthood. Because of the way I write, which is sort of blind, and I don't really know what the story will be, I thought this was gonna be another one of the, the several books I've written in which the father is, is, a very, uh, is sort of an absent character. That turned out to be less true than I had thought. Um, and what I, what I think, the aspect of parenthood that I think I ended up writing about here, a little bit without knowing it, is the difficulty that parents have letting their children become separate from them and live their own lives. And it was funny to be writing about that because when I started the first draft, my children were still young enough, I have two sons, who, that I really hadn't confronted that problem at all in my own life. You know, they were, they simply adored us and wanted to be with us all the time, and I assumed that it would, of course, go on that way forever. Um, but then I, when, I, when my older son turned about 14 and suddenly said, guess what, I want to do things with my friends and we're not going to the zoo anymore, I was heartbroken and, and appalled um, and clenched all the tighter. You can imagine how well that worked. Um, but in a, fun, in a certain way, what I realized as I was meanwhile working on my revisions was that in a way I had already been working on that story. You know, you can see here that Anna has been groomed by her father to be rather secretive. You know, he's, he's obviously engaged in illegal activity of, of some kind and she is privy to that. And what we learn when she goes back home is that this is completely a secret from her mother. Um, and so Anna, in a way, has, has been groomed to be a keeper of secrets, but what becomes very difficult between Anna and her father is when he begins to sense that that secrecy is working against him, that he's not part of the secrets. Um, and Ge Dexter Stiles, whose point of view you don't hear much of here, is also a major character in the book, and a lot of what, I mean, he's, he is definitely an underworld boss, and, and criminal activity is a big part of his life, but he also is you know, very close to his daughter and full of expectations for her and having all kinds of issues of his own with her growing up. So 
it's certainly about parenthood, among a lot of other things. I've read a lot about how your, the Goon Squad was like a mosaic of all different things, whereas this is more of a traditional novel. Should we draw any conclusion about that? And could you talk a little bit about why you opted for traditional novel, as people are saying? Um, sure. I, I originally thought, uh, interestingly, Goon Squad, in a lot of ways, certain things about it, especially some of its structural playfulness, arose from research I was doing for this book. And I'll give you one example. I read a lengthy correspondence between Lucille Colkin and her husband, Al Colkin. Uh, this was at the Brooklyn Historical Society, and they were both Brooklyn Navy Yard employees. And uh, Matt, she was a um, ship fitter, he was a machinist. They met and got married rather quickly. In fact, she referred to it as uh, from maidenhood, maidenhood to marriage in three easy months. Um, then Al joined the Navy, and, she, and Lucy wrote to him daily, uh, sometimes more than once a day, these wonderful letters. I mean, they're just, it's the kind of letters that one is so happy found their way into the public domain. She was full of information. She was very sassy and colloquial. Um, at one point, she kissed the paper, and every single impression of her lips was as if she had done it yesterday. Um, and she was crazy about Al. And so at one point she was fantasizing about whether, you know, she'd had a dream that, that, she, that they had had a son. And she said, oh, Butch, that's what she called him. Um, you know, I, gosh, where will we live and what will our lives be like? Uh, I just, you know, I, I, I love you so much. And I thought, I want to know what their lives were like and where they lived. I mean, the, there are answers to these questions. That was 1943. So of course, I walked over to the nearest computer thinking, maybe I can actually find Lucy and interview her. And I typed in her name. And within 60 seconds of reading this, this fantasy about the future, I was reading her obituary. And it was really shocking to be able to know that so suddenly. And she, it turned out she had had two daughters, and um, her husband had survived her, and she had died just a few years before. And I felt like I was in shock. I mean, I sat back down, and I returned to the letters. You know, oh, I got a sunburn at Cody, Coney Island. I'm putting bicarbonate of soda on it. But I kept thinking, but I know the end of the story. How can I know this? And stay? It, it was very strange. And it led me to think about how what it is like to read about the present when it is infused with a knowledge of the future. And that device is something I used quite a bit in A Visit from the Goon Squad. And in fact, the whole nature of the organization of the book is that we often know what happened later before we know what happened earlier, and it changes the way we read it. So I'll just I'll give one little addendum and then get to this book. I, publi I published an essay about that experience of reading these letters and being so shocked by Lucy's passing um, in a book of essays about Brooklyn. And a few weeks later, I received an email with the subject line, I am Lucy's daughter, which was incredible. And so I ended up going on a tour of the Brooklyn Navy Yard with both of Lucy's daughters and their families and Al, who was 88 or something. Now, I was a little shy around Al because I felt like I knew way too much about him. <laughs> I mean, I had read lines like, um, you know, two kisses and an eatsy weensy pinch on the aft end from Lucy to Al. So I was like, um, and Al seemed also a little, I think, you know, he knew what was in those letters. Um, but anyway, just to say that I ended up sort of involved with Lucy's family, and, um, and I, I'm in touch with her, one of her daughters frequently. She's a retired librarian, travels all over the country, and sends Google photos of everything she does. And, it's, and so I've, I've ended up sort of knowing Lucy in, in this indirect way. Anyway, when it came time to actually work on Manhattan Beach, of course I assumed that I would use some of these same techniques. But what I found, surprisingly, was they did not work. They were not fun. In fact, being for the reader, being wrenched out of the, of the story and reminded of the fact that that was the past and now it's the present and 9-11 has happened was a bummer. Um, I'm part of a writing group, and when I would bring in sections like that, they, their reactions began as sort of like, you know, not enthusiastic, but 
evolved into outright anger. <laughs> and they just said, stop doing that, we hate it. Um, so I realized that it, oddly, you know, it, it, it didn't help the story. The story didn't live when I did that. So I stopped doing all of that and what I realized was I didn't need to. You know, you know you're reading this book in the present day and I know that I wrote it in the present day. And so the present and everything that's happened between the time I'm writing about and now floats almost allegorically in all of our minds. And so having me call attention to it repeatedly ends up feeling sort of didactic and unnecessary. Um, and so I, I've always done all of the things I've done structurally to try to serve the story I'm telling. And in this case, it required much more straightforwardness. We have time for a couple more questions. Does someone have a question? Yes. The reader was surprised by Anna's anger at her father. Well, her father abandoned the family. Um, he disappears without a trace, and that's not giving much away because, um, because that happens fairly soon. We leap ahead in time after a few chapters about that happened in the period that I was reading about. Um, gosh, I don't know what to say. I, I mean, I, I can come up with all kinds of reasons that I think it's understandable that someone might be angry at her father for abandoning the family, um, especially when it contains a very impaired younger sister who can't um, sit or really talk. Um, and, uh, and so there's, you know, it, it's really hard to be left behind in that way. Um, but I, but that, in a way, that's, that's no use because your experience of the book was that it didn't make sense to you. And so all I can do is say, um, I'm so sorry, <laughs> because... <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if we, we can, if you're in the signing line, we can talk, talk more about this, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it, one of the very strange things about publishing a book is that in the end, it's not really mine anymore. And I, I, I feel that the things that happen sort of makes sense. I don't worry, I'm not someone who sort of designs from above. I really do follow the, the atmosphere into the characters and the characters into the action. So it's not like I would ever stand back and say, you know, Anna should be angrier or Anna isn't angry enough. I'm trying to just do it more instinctively in the hopes of a, an organic whole. Um, but, uh, you know, in the end, I don't, I, it's hard for me to know exactly how it will be read, although I do rely a lot on readers. I, I don't want to underestimate that. Not only do I have a writing group in which we read everything aloud, um, which is interesting, so there's no homework, there's no, you know, quickly on the subway trying to skim it because I didn't have time to read it. Uh, we have the experience together. And then in the end, I also give the manuscript to lots of, of people just, again, to try to understand whether the things I think are coming through really are coming through for the reader. Oh, more questions. Okay, yes. Did I find a female diver? Good question. When I interviewed Jim Kennedy, the gentleman who had dived in Cherbourg, I asked him if he had encountered any female divers during the war, and he said, yes, a Russian woman, which is fascinating because, well, of course, what we're learning now is that women, Russian women did everything during the war, um, including diving. So I was excited to talk to Jim Kennedy about this Russian. Of course, I imagine there might be more to the story that I could get to on the telephone. And then, as I said, unfortunately, he passed away suddenly. Um, I highly doubt that any women dived at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, but there's almost no information about the diving program, period. So it's, there, I don't really know. I did spend a lot of time on the phone with a wonderful woman named Andrea Motley Crabtree, who was the first female army diver. Uh, now, I'm guessing women dove in the Navy earlier. There are more divers in the Navy, but if you can believe it, the first army female diver dove in the early 80s. <laughs> That's how male it is. <laughs> Um, and she, she experienced tremendous sexism. She loved diving, and, and I relied a lot on her descriptions of the sensual nature of it, especially what it's like to be near huge ships. 
but she was essentially driven out of diving by sexism. And interestingly, she's also African American, but it was race was not the problem, according to her. It was really gender. Um, she, we've spent hours and hours on the phone, and I'm very fond of her. Um, but it's, she certainly was not diving in the 40s, 40 years later, actually. Yes? When did you start writing the book? And how much research did you do? Which I, it seems like you did a lot of research. Have you done research on any particular research in the writing of the book? The question is uh, the re kind of relationship of research to writing in terms of the timeline. I can tell you exactly. Researched in a kind of desultory, experiential way from 2005 to 2010, and then started writing in 2012. At that point, uh, of course, far from having finished my research, I now began to have an inkling of what the book would actually be about, what would happen, and so I would have to do a lot more research, often just one step ahead of when I would need to use it, because sometimes I, I needed to do research before I could even begin to dramatize things like deep sea diving when I've never even scuba dived. I would be frantically on the telephone with my diving gurus, of whom there were many, including Andrea, um, just you know, like a week ahead of when I knew I would have to try to at least blunder my way through an early version of a diving scene. There, there was the, the, a lot of this is so technical that even though it wasn't that I wanted to harp on the technical details, but without knowing them, I simply could not write the scene. Um, so I researched continuously throughout the writing process, and it for a certain period when I really thought this book might not work and I felt a lot of worry about it, the research was, was the, the joyous, the most joyful part. Because first of all, as I think I've conveyed, I had very meaningful experiences with living people, which I will always be grateful for. But also, it felt so strangely relevant that, that I, I took heart from that, that there really was going to be a book at the end of the day, because I thought, if I can read the Merchant Marine Officer's Handbook from 1943 on the elliptical machine at Crunch Gym, there's got to be a reason. I mean, I got some funny looks from the people around me as I like strained to read tiny print in How to Abandon Ship. Um, so the research was a, a really vital part of it. And I have to say, I really miss working on this book, in part just because of the, the pleasure of being delivered to another time and place. And the, and the research was a part of that because I, of course, used a tiny fraction of, of what I knew. And I can get a little long-winded at a dinner party blabbing about you know, air shafts and, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and various, you know, equipment on, on merchant uh, sail cargo ships, liberty ships, of which I've become a slight self-appointed expert. So I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to call our time because of the need to bring in the next group. Can we get a round of applause for Jennifer? I'm happy to answer questions outside, too. Thank you.